Okay. Um, so, so as as Episcopalians, we are much in line with with Genesis two, that that marriage is not just for procreation, but for mutual support of one another, mm -hmm. um, and that 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 is what marriage is is all about. It's it's another way of sharing in the body of Christ. Mm -hmm. It's about mutually caring for and supporting one another. It is not necessarily about procreation. That's why I have no problem. Having presiding at a wedding for a 90-year-old couple. Say, this woman. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. <laughs> How about myself? But, but that separates us from Roman Catholic theology, too, yeah. where marriage is for procreation. And, 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 and if you can't procreate, it's very dicey in the Roman church getting, getting mm -hmm. married. Um, okay, so that's a big difference there, too. All right. Marriage signifies an authentic giving of self, or else it is just a ceremony, it's not a sacrament. Um, the right has the potential of signifying more than the person can apprehend at the moment, you think? <laughs> <laughs> but like any sacrament, a new identity is established there, mm -hmm. and, and that's important. Uh, okay. Okay. Is that good? Yeah. Okay. So, reconciliation, what we used to call confession. So we do have that private right in the church. Some people don't even know that, that, that we have a right of private confession in the, in the Episcopal Church. Um, so, and that right is very much like in the Roman Church or the, the Orthodox Church, our, our private right. It's all about admitting sin to a trusted person. Um, something, uh, something we all do. Uh, words of assurance from that person uh, that represent some sort of absolution. Um, so, so as we talked about, there we we believe there's a right for that private, uh, a need for that private right because um, because sometimes. You need to confess things that you, know, you, that you need to deal with uh, personally mm -hmm. and you can't do in a community setting. Uh, and that happens all the time. Um, so, so we have this right, and it's kind of like in the Catholic Church, and we don't have a little box you go in. Um, usually when someone wants to do confession, they just come to me or whoever and, and say something. Uh, and we usually just go to the chapel or something like that and have a conversation, which would include an, an absolution right, uh, similar to what to what you, you've seen in, in the Catholic Church. But I will tell you that that the, the huge majority of private confessions that I've done as a priest um, have happened very differently. Um, I'm walking down the street with somebody, a parishioner. We're having a conversation about something else. We're talking about whatever. We're talking about basketball. And suddenly I realize that this person is confessing something that they've done. Um, that's how it usually happens in our church. Uh, and, and, when, and, and when that happens, I state out loud that that's happened and, and that, so that we're going to approach it that way. And we'll talk about, about how we're, we're going to handle that um, in that situation. And even in those cases, um, confidentiality remains the most important thing. So, um, so it's very important for a priest to be able to discern when someone's confessing, even though they're not calling it that, uh, and so, that so that you realize that and then uh, the, same, the same confidentiality applies in all of those situations. So um, that right is available to all of you anytime. Um, and any of those, either of those approaches is, is fine uh, getting into it. So you've all seen the movies about, uh, about priests, um, somebody uh, confessing a, a murder or something or some heinous crime yeah, in the yeah, movies. Yeah. And, and then what? And then the drama builds because the priest isn't allowed to say anything. But is the priest going to say something? You know, the, the whole deal. Um, the, 
The only time for me personally that that becomes an issue is child abuse. Yeah. 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 Um, and that gets really dicey because by law, I must um, report any incidents of child abuse with good reason. Yes. Um, yeah. And, and you know, we don't ever want to be in the position the Roman church is now with the... Um, yeah. Oh. Yep. yep. So, so, so we've got to be extra, extra careful about that. But at the same time, I have taken this, this uh, vow of secrecy. So um, everything else is, is easy to handle, but that particular situation is very difficult. And I'll tell you just what I personally do, and that is I, I do my best to talk the person into giving themselves up or, or, or tell, telling the authorities. And I will say, you know, this is the one thing that I'm not allowed to, to just let go. Um, so far, I've been fortunate enough that that everyone has agreed to, to, to do so and, and report it, um, with the exception of, of one case, and that case got solved a different way that I can't tell you about, but it, it, it happened. Um, so, that's the fun stuff there. Karen? So, can I ask what, how, what you do when it is a case of murder or homicide or something like that? Like you uh, go to court, you know, that type of thing. Yeah, uh, I, I do the same kind of thing. I, I suggest I try to, to talk them I, into. Yep, yeah, I mm -hmm. suggest to the person that you know, mm -hmm. and that I'll do what I can to help them. I'll back them up, you know. I'll stand with them in this process. I'll go to court with you know, go to court with them. And just kind of things. I have one other question because yes. it did involve me. What if a child who is being abused comes to you in confidence? That's different. Okay. How do you help that poor child? I was told that I must be a very bad little girl and I needed to go home so my mother wouldn't beat me anymore. So first, the first thing we do is, is care for the child okay. um, and, and get the child in a professional therapeutic situation. Okay. Um, and I'm not qualified to do that, only at the... I get about one-third of the counseling training that, uh, like, uh, as a regular... Therapist. Psychotherapist, okay. yeah. Um, so, so uh, the the key is to know when it's beyond you, when you, when you need to turn it over, and that would be the case in every single one of those. So, if a child came and really was badly battered, you would step in to help them be removed from the situation. And, and, yeah, I would immediately step in to get to get them out of the situation, yeah. Yeah. and then I'd, I'd help get them. Because a kid to have enough courage to come to anybody. Oh my gosh! Yeah, yeah that's the biggest thing. Yes, Steve. Um, yeah. um, at least one other, one minister of another dom denomination, I said to him, well, where did you get your pastoral training? And he uh -huh. said he got zero pastoral no training. Kidding. What, what denomination? Disciples no. of Christ. Oh, um, well, what? Well, that's what, what he said. He okay. said the okay. seminary certainly had nothing. And huh. all he learned was when he interned okay. with at a church and actually had hands-on experience. Interesting. And, and so that, and so, it, it, the background you've gotten, has that been because of the diocese? Or be, no, or no, no, all, <clears throat> all Episcopal priests um, must have, um, must go through a Master of Divinity program, uh -huh. which includes um, X number of credits <clears throat> of pastoral care. Oh, it does? Yeah, 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 yeah absolutely. Okay. Um, and then, you have to do field education in the field before you become ordained. Uh -huh. Either in uh, either in a hospital setting or a prison setting. How long does that generally take? Clinical pastor education. Well, the whole thing. The whole thing. From the time oh. you... uh, seminaries uh, generally three years. College seminary and then your yeah. seminary yeah. itself is three years, and wow. then field education is usually done three or four months over some. Wow. So it's yeah, I wasn't extensive. kidding when we, yeah, we <laughs> well, really are the best educated. Because <laughs> 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 it's my male stuff. Yeah, that's, okay. yeah I'm, that's, that surprises me. That really surprises me. I don't know if he overstated, overstated it. Yeah, I don't know, maybe he was just saying we yeah. didn't, he didn't get much, but that, that's He was definitely well, that disappointed by him. what the seminary provided him. <clears throat> yeah. He said it was all academic. I don't have a direct, um, experience with the disciples of Christ. Yeah. Um, 
They're it's under the UCC care. umbrella. Hmm. Are they now? Yes. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and, and the UCC pastors I know have had a have, yeah. have, have the same amount of pastoral care mm -hmm. training as I do. So. Ironically, his his wife manages hospices. Oh my god! Oh my goodness! That's what I know. Um. So, uh, just to make a uh, uh, a Christian Testament connection to to <coughs> confession, uh, obviously Jesus forgives sin. And Jesus never trivializes sin in any way. Um, and, and it's never a barrier for Jesus, right? So that's how we try to live in the confession, the, the same kind of way. Um, I, I personally think, so editorial here, okay, this is me again, <laughs> that the danger of reconciliation is discounting communal and social sin. We became so hung up in this church about individual salvation and private penance and for getting forgiven for whatever you personally did wrong. And I think we've done that to the detriment of society in some ways because we, we discounted communal sin on so many levels. Uh, and and I, I think that part of that has, has hurt us. Um, so, I mean... You know, I think about, well, I don't have to say them all, but um, the, what we've done to the earth, um, yeah. that has been a very communal kind of sin. It's not an, an individual sin. And I think we hurt ourselves when we concentrate totally on individual sin. So we're trying very hard here to talk about this communally and how what we do as, as human beings. Uh, and, and try to get us out of that, that social... Like the prayer, one of the prayers to the people today. Today, yep. Mm -hmm. Focusing on the damage we're doing to our environment. Right, right. Exactly, exactly. Karen? So, if we, if we were to do some kind of um, communal action uh, about some kind of systemic injustice or institutional injustice right. how would that what would that look like I've been hmm, I've been really interested in the truth and reconciliation work that was done in South Africa but yeah. other than that I really don't have any idea of what it might look like well we try to do that in, within the body of the service um, often we I try to choose confessions of sin that not only uh, attach to the readings, but that talk about what we've done communally. communally. And yeah. we almost always put it in prayers of the people okay. every week. So, so that's one of the ways. But it sure wouldn't hurt us to have um, to have a wholly separate um, rite of reconciliation in the world. Um, in the old days, mm -hmm. in the old days, when I first started doing creation liturgies, um, I kind of followed that model. The beginning of the service would be about all the stuff that we did wrong to the earth. And, and we'd spend a lot of mea culpa stuff talking about everything that we'd done wrong. And then we would build out of that to how we're going to create this new world um, mm -hmm. out of that. I've kind of moved away from that because because it's so difficult for a lot of people to process that in the yeah. body, but it wouldn't hurt for us to do a separate service like that. So I think we should. Sure. <coughs> That's probably a good idea. Mm -hmm. okay. Uh, okay, ministry to the sick. Um, so, uh, so uh, all we have sacramental rites as we went through the prayer book um, for ministry to uh, to the sick and the dying. So you know we have this this set of liturgies doing that. Um, all of those liturgies are, are about trying to take a holistic approach to the, to the whole person, um, a waiting on God in which we don't know what the outcome is going to be. Um, it's all about a ministry of compassion and care. Um, all of our healing rites, like we did in the body of the service today, um, all of our healing rites, remember, are are not necessarily about curing, they're about healing. There's a very big difference between curing and healing. 
Um, we don't know how God's going to respond to something, um, but but we are not necessarily praying for someone's disease to be taken away from them um, as much as we are praying for healing of who they are as a whole person. Um, uh, I can't help but think about um, <coughs> about my friend uh, Glenn Gossard, who I talked about on Ash Wednesday, mm -hmm. um, who, uh, who was exposed to uh, radiation. He lived in Williams, Arizona, and was exposed to all the nuclear <coughs> tests um, and, and got uh, and <coughs> a cancer from that. Um, at, Glenn went through all kinds of processes to get rid of that cancer, and he actually went into remission twice during that process, um, but but it eventually caught up with him. And when Glenn and I would pray, he knew darn well that we weren't necessarily praying um, for him to be cured from, from this. We were praying that he'd be around long enough to see his kids grow up a little bit more. Um, and, and he realized that. He realized that, that he was going to die earlier than than you know, most people, um, but he was, by the time he died, he was totally healed. Um, mm -hmm. he, he had let go of everything that, that was bothering him in any form. There was nothing left there but his love for his family and us. It was quite beautiful. Um, so that, that's a typical situation that we're working for in that kind of way. It's all about healing. It's also about fighting society's obsession with this denial of death. Um, you know, we, we, we do everything in society to make believe we're not going to die. Um, and, and that has really hurt us because I think it hurts us, our opportunity for healing. Um, so uh, so it's a, that's a big part of this, too, is, is fighting that. And, of course, that's what Ash Wednesday is all about. Um, that's why I wouldn't put glitter on our ashes on Valentine's Day, Ash Wednesday. What? <laughs> <laughs> oh, was, Somebody suggested it? Oh, we, I was with a group of clergy and half of them were doing that. Oh, you are kidding. No, they were doing it? They yeah. were doing you it? Are oh. yeah. Because they wanted to connect the two, love the and pages. death together. So and we went a totally <laughs> different way here to do that. Uh -huh. And I think we did connect love and death yes. on Ash Wednesday. It's a beautiful to do it. <laughs> anyway, but you get the idea. Right? <laughs> so this whole holistic approach to medicine now that includes spiritual healing as well as physical healing, um, is happening a lot more in, in hospitals. Um, many of the more progressive hospitals now have chaplains on site. Um, Joe Fitzgerald, um, our priest here, is the, ch the main chaplain at UMC. Um, they, they have a whole healing um, program associated with, with the hospital and everything they do. And that's really cool, because this is supposed to be a shared ministry and when, when priests can work with doctors and nurses to help somebody in the healing process, it works so much. Yeah. I, I just wanted to say, I have the understanding, and maybe I'm wrong about this, that the glitter was for the homosexual community? That That's happened too, yes. <coughs> oh. Well, that would make sense. There was a movement you know, in the gay community years ago um, to, to represent that, and, and uh, the idea was um, <clears throat> was to try to connect us to our understanding that we're all uh, stars, that we're all stardust. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, yeah. And, uh, and, and that was quite lovely. Uh, and we try to represent that in different forms here, mm -hmm. but I thought the glitter was taking us the wrong direction, because the idea is is to remind us all that we're going to die, mm -hmm. and and and, uh, and glitter was not a helpful way to, to do that in my mind. There were plenty of people who used this that right, um, and and it apparently worked. But wow. that's what, I'm what about Easter Sunday and April first? <laughs> <laughs> 
April Fool's Day. Yeah. <laughs> How are you gonna get that? Shall we be fools for Christ? Yes. Ooh. See, you guys yeah. already coming See, up there. It is. Oh, yes. Yes. Fools for Christ. Mm -hmm. Yeah, why not? It's a good tradition, actually. <laughs> yeah, actually it is. Mm -hmm. April Fool's. He's here. <laughs> oh, he is? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, he's got the look. <laughs> you guys are just happy you don't have to do it. I say we now know what you're going to open with. That's right. <laughs> we'll be waiting. Uh -huh. <laughs> what else? <coughs> what else? We have, we have 10 minutes actually. So. I have a question. Yep. Um, we've talked some about prayer book changing over the years and decades and millennia and whatnot, and that there's one, you know, a new one in the works, whatever right. that means. Right. Um, and then you were speaking about the uh, sacraments, and there's two, and then the seven, and not counting them, and that kind of stuff. Right. Um, is there a process for determining that something, uh, something else is a sacrament? Wow. And if Good so, question. would that yeah. happen completely separately from creating a prayer book? I would think so. Because that's, it's like a revelation thing. I mean, I don't know what else you're going to make a sacrament officially. Yeah. Is that a thing? <laughs> <laughs> no, that's a good question. Um, I don't know that it is a thing. Uh, the, the folks serving on the, the Liturgy and Music uh, Commission are not working on anything on that front that I, that I am aware of. Uh, because, I'm going to guess, because we believe that, that everything has the opportunity to be sacramental, um, and that what we want to do is link people to, all, to God through all of creation, that, um, that it doesn't make sense to create another individual right. But we're going to keep the others because that's the tradition because part. Because it's the ancient tradition. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. We don't throw out the baby with the bathwater. Yeah. Just but, keep them and have the new understanding. In practice, those things happen all the time. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. like foot washing. Mm -hmm. um, well, that's a good example of one that might like be part the of the... healing right that we will... I call that right the sacrament of healing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We don't have a sacrament of healing in that fashion. We, we have administration at the time of death, but we don't have a, a sacrament of healing. Mm -hmm. So I, I think it's just more that kind of... It feels sacramental. Well, it is sacramental. Mm -hmm. That's the right. whole point. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. That's hmm. good. What else? What did we not talk about? Let, let me just, uh, let me give you the five things that all those churches agreed on that oh, Baptist okay. meetings. Mm -hmm. I didn't say that. Um, so we're talking about all those mainline churches. Uh, and we're, we'll separate those churches in the last week. But basically we're talking about uh, the ELCA Lutheran Church, the United Methodist Church, the Disciples of Christ, the UCC, the Presbyterian USA. Who am I forgetting? Uh, the, the Roman Catholic Church. Us. The Greek Church. Did I say Disciples of Christ? What? Yeah, yeah. you did. Greek Church. Orthodox. Which Church? The Greek, Greek Orthodox. The Greek, yeah, the Orthodox Church, yes. I'm, I'm sure I'm forgetting someone, but you, you, get, you get the idea. So. Where does the African Methodist? We're going to do that the last one. You'll do that the yep. Okay. Yep. I'm just curious. Because that is kind of yeah. confusing. So, <laughs> yeah. that. so we all agreed that baptism means this. Number one, that it's a participation in Christ's life, death, and resurrection. And that we're participating in that whole process. Number two, it is about conversion and cleansing and pardoning. We're not taking that part away. We still believe that baptism is a cleansing. Obviously, okay. that's what we're symbolizing there. Um, number three, that it's a gift of the Spirit. There's, that, that this is a gift that God is giving us. There's uh, nothing that we can do about that. Uh, number four, 
that it is, as we said, an incorporation into the whole body of Christ. And it's bringing all of us together. And number five, it's a sign of God's realm. It's a sign of the kingdom of God. <coughs> that through baptism we get to see part of that, of that kingdom of God. Yes, sir, James. What's your feeling on immersion versus, versus sprinkling? I didn't hear the Could you Immersion repeat that? Versus oh, okay. So, um, so good question. Uh, we talked about at the beginning, James, that um, we recognize any baptism from any Christian church. So, so it's all good. It all counts, no matter which way you're doing it. It's, it's all lovely. Um, personally, I, as you know. Um, I think, you know, maybe I should say this too, I believe that all of our sacramental actions should be grand and obvious. Um, I, I think it's very important for us to, um, to show this symbol in the, in the grandest, most luxurious way we can. Mm -hmm. Because it's representing something beyond what we can, we can explain. So I think it needs to be big. So we're not immersing people here because I don't know how we do that. Yeah, By the way, we're looking for another baptismal font, and I'm looking for ideas. Um, but <laughs> uh, yeah, um, so so that's why when we work with that little font, I get people totally wet, and water goes over half the time <laughs> in that process because I think it's important for people to see just how. How fantastic this is, and, yeah. and what's going on here. Yes, I remember. Yeah. Yeah. I remember. In, in most, in most Episcopal churches, in most mainline churches, you will see um, the minister um, put their finger in some chrism and yeah. make the sign of the cross on the people's head. Um, after that, and those of you who have seen a baptism here know that I pour oil over their right. head mm -hmm. because <laughs> yes, because it's special. This is yeah. all about abundance. This is all about right. God's abundance totally <laughs> overwhelming us. And people come back to me weeks later and say, I can still smell it. Uh -huh. I can still smell it. That's what that's all about. So I don't know if that's answering the question. I don't think it needs to be either one. But I think it's gonna, it should be grand no matter what. Charlie. Okay. I'm, I'm one of his crucifers, okay? Or something up He's there. the tall guy. You're not my crucifer. Yeah, you are. Because I, I was up there one time and they're having a baptism. Oh, I've never done this before. The last baptism him. that you did. He did. By the time I got through, <laughs> I had been, he had baptized me along with everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> and handed and, him and the he bowl. He gave me the big bowl full of water. I'm like, what the hell am I going to do with it? <laughs> So, You're the water bearer. Yes, I'm you the water bearer. Water water. He came but home and said, I'm so glad I didn't drop it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I appreciate you know, I but you know, I I love helping assisting. Okay? I really He just didn't it. expect you to hand him I the big bowl of water. And uh, you know, they, and being you know, being elderly, uh, I just Is that you what know, you are? Oh,